true murder is a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer. I would also play with yes. Thank you to play with Sam. The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. Actors, musicians, TV personalities, and other public figures in the spotlight aren't always who they appear to be. You might be surprised by just how many have led nefarious double lives and have become infamous criminals. Power, status, and a rich lifestyle aren't barriers to criminal behavior. Yes, people from all walks of life commit crimes, but the people featured here are not your typical neighbors or subway passengers. They are household names and Hollywood stars. Get the stories behind these public figures, both contemporary and historical, who have traveled down the murky pathway toward criminal activity. After committing their crimes, the world may have kept on turning, but their legacies as infamous criminals remain strong worldwide. This book offers a fascinating assortment of true crime cases from around the world and from various time frames. Like the previous anthologies in the Best New True Crime Story series, this volume contains all new and original nonfiction accounts penned by international writers from across the literary spectrum, including true crime, crime fiction, and journalism. Inside you'll find the stories of Hollywood stars and famous criminals who went down the wrong path, encounters that feature the cases of infamous criminals like Robert Blake, Jimmy Savile, Fatty Arbuckle, and more. The book that we're featuring this evening is The Best New True Crime Stories, Crimes of Famous and Infamous Criminals, with my special guest, editor, author, Mitzi Serrato. Welcome back to the program, and thank you so much for this interview. Mitzi Serrato. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me back. Thank you so much. And thank you. And congratulations on this new anthology. Oh, thanks. This is book seven now in my series. Wow. Now let's talk about the contents and I will just read the contents and then you can and, and mention the author involved. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the story itself. Just briefly, the first chapter you have is called Rolf Harris, Australia's Forgotten Son with author Anthony Ferguson. Yes, well, actually, Anthony's a returning contributor to the series. He's an Australian author, and he actually chose this particular story because Rolf Harris is from Western Australia, the Perth area, and Anthony, that's Anthony's area as well. So it was somebody that he sort of remembered from his own childhood and was like the the local boy makes good kind of thing. Right. But Rolf Harris... As I said, he's an Australian. He he started out in Australian TV and whatnot. Uh, he was a children's entertainer, an artist, a musician. He kind of got famous for actually playing an Aboriginal instrument and making that something that was more mainstreamed. And he eventually he went to Britain and he became a huge star over in Britain. And unfortunately, he was also a sexual predator including children and young teens. And so he had a bit of a history with that and had gone through the courts and the charges and whatnot. And the usual excuse from someone of his generation was that, you know, maybe he was just a bit too touchy-feely with the ladies kind of thing, but that didn't quite wash. There was just too much evidence against him and his predatory behavior. Your second chapter is Wrestling with Demons by author Joe Turner. Joe is another returning author to the series. Uh, he's a British author, and he was particularly interested in writing this story. It's about Chris Benoit, who was originally from Montreal, and he became a huge, huge global star of pro wrestling. And, you know, the, we're talking that pro wrestling with really hardcore stuff, like people that take incredible abuse to their bodies, you know, breaking right. chairs over heads, that kind of thing. So Chris was living in Georgia, and sadly, he ended up murdering his wife and young son while they slept in their beds. Yeah, that's an incredible story. The third chapter you have is The Rise and Fall of the Disco King by author Janelle Camo. Yes, Janelle is another returning contributor. Uh, she's a writer from 
Canada, Nova Scotia area. And this story, it's a fun story in a way because she chronicles sort of the whole rise and fall, as it says in the title. And it's about Steve Rubell, who was the very famous figure behind the Studio 54 nightclub in Manhattan, which was the icon of the 1970s, the whole disco scene, you know, the famous thing with people lined up outside trying to do everything they can to get in. So, you know, it was it was a time of incredible excess, you know, drugs, sex. I mean, they actually had people having sex in the uh, balconies, that kind of thing. He would go around passing quaaludes to customers. But, you know, at the time, you know, we're talking a different time frame. This was more so a cash business. And when this, you're talking an incredible, successful uh, nightclub. So the temptation, I guess, was just too much. And there were two sets of books. And the fall eventually came when it was found that Steve was not paying the Internal Revenue Service the taxes that they were technically owed. Yeah. Your fourth chapter is The Vampire of Holloway Drive, and we're going to explore this story in in more detail. And this is from author Jill Hand. Just briefly, and we will come back to this Vampire of Holloway Drive because it's such an extraordinary story among these other extraordinary stories. But tell us a little bit about The Vampire of Holloway Drive before we continue with the contents themselves. Sure. Well, this is written by Jill Hand. She's an American writer. She's new to the series. And I didn't know about this story at all, but it's it's about a young man, uh, Blake Libel, who was from an extremely wealthy family in Toronto, and he wanted to make it big in Hollywood. You know, he was an aspiring screenwriter, an aspiring director, eventually an aspiring graphic novelist. And it ends up where he murders his fiance in, in a particularly horrendous, heinous way. Your fifth chapter is Lord Lucan and the Twice Dead Aristocrat by author Charlotte Platt. Yes, Charlotte's returning to the series as well. She's a writer from Scotland. And this story is really, really well known to uh, a lot of British readers. But, you know, she has an interesting take on it. Lord Lucan was British aristocrat. And it was 1960s London, so you've got that whole wonderful vibe from that particular era. And he was a a gambler. He basically had nothing much to do. He didn't have to earn a living. So he was just playing backgammon and whatever he liked to do. This was sort of his whole life. He just gambled. But he unfortunately lost a lot more money than he won. And he ended up with a lot of debt, a lot of pressure against him. It took a big toll on his marriage to the point where he pretty much was ousted from the house. His wife just couldn't have him there anymore. And he kind of unraveled. He just became really, really unraveling and and stalking his family, stalking his wife. And ultimately, it ended up where he murdered the children's nanny and he attempted to murder his wife. And then he disappeared. Yes, fascinating. And pronounced dead, you say, twice and both times without a body. Very, very interesting story. Even up to this day, exactly. There's just been no body. Your sixth chapter is Life of the Party with author Alicia or Alicia Holland. Yeah, Alicia's new to the series. She's actually well known from her podcast, Murder in the Rain, which is a Pacific Northwest themed podcast, obviously, with rain. And Life of the Party is about, this is a very famous case, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who was a huge, huge star of the silent screen era. And he... Uh, yeah, he was probably one of the highest paid stars of the time. Everybody loved him. And, you know, you have to wonder if maybe the business thought he was being paid too much. But it ended up where he was uh, up in San Francisco with some friends. He didn't even want to be there, really. But a bit of a party was going on in the suite. There were several people there, other people in the show, show business, smaller bit actors, whatnot, bit actresses. And he's ultimately used of causing the death of a young actress by the name of Virginia Rapp. And there were, I believe, three times they tried him on this. Yes. And it just, apparently, he did not do this, but he was so condemned by the public. It was an egregious case of trial by public opinion. And there's an interesting take in the story that Alicia brings it to the contemporary period with the whole cancel culture that we have and people being condemned before the facts are in. And it's so it's a story that maybe it was from, you know, the 1920s, but it's very relevant even now. Absolutely. You talk about 
Fatty Arbuckle, you say that one of the biggest movie stars and biggest stars in, in the world. And yet there's three trials to exonerate him. And the jurors went out of their way to say, not only we are exonerating him, that this man has endured some incredible injustice and he is totally innocent. And yet his career was ruined. And despite being exonerated. And like you say, this was a very, very good example of the, the irresponsible newspapers, Randolph Hearst and his newspapers, printing any salacious rumor or things that weren't factual whatsoever. So he was basically tried and convicted much before the trial and the interesting medical examiner's conclusions that she had died of a ruptured bladder. Yeah, exactly. That that he was Having he was okay, he, he wasn't called fatty for no reason. He was a he was a very large man. Yes. And it was assumed that he crushed her crushed her bladder to death while having sex with her. That was what was uh believed. Yeah, that's a incredible story. And there is much more to read about that because he sort of gets his career back using a different name because his name, his real name has been so tarnished, but he has a great day and you talk about what happens the very next day. So for people that are going to discover this book, it's a fascinating twist to the end of that story. Let's talk about chapter seven and a chapter you call Jim Fixed It, The Shocking Crimes of Jimmy Savile by author Mark Fryers. Yes, Mark is a British author. He's again returning to the series. And this case is probably more familiar to people since I believe there was a, the Netflix series rather rather recently. But it's about a Sir James Savile, who was basically a national institution in the UK for decades. He was a, a TV star, entertainer, children's television, and major charity figurehead. I mean, he just had a reputation of just, you know, he was involved in hospitals, everything. He was connected with the royal family, many members of the royal family, including the late Princess Diana. Yes. He knew everybody. He even worked with the Beatles. I mean, this guy was connected. But apparently, after his death, it all came out about a long, long, long history of being a sexual predator. Children, women, teens. It was just horrendous. Some of his victims, he even victimized in their hospital beds, wow. if you can believe it. Like there was an instance of a young girl who I believe was a skin cancer patient and he was in there with her. And it was a, one of those situations where, you know, it was the kind of thing that nobody would talk about it. And if you did say something, it wasn't believed because this is Jimmy Savile. This is like yeah. he even had some sort of a papal dispensation put upon him. He was wow. nobody believed it. And, and we're talking of uh, this guy was a star from the 1950s. 50s into the 2000s. So the amount of victims, who knows at this point? Absolutely. A much different time and a much different perception of why people might be innocent despite allegations, because there were allegations for years and rumors milling around. Exactly. But nothing ever was believed. It was just he was friendly with police, would have them over to his flat. I mean, he just he was a real manipulator. Absolutely. Now, chapter eight is called Garth Drabinsky, Theatrical Impresario to Convicted Fraudster by author Anya Wassenberg. Yes, Anya's returning to the series. She was in the previous book. She's a Canadian writer and she writes about Darth Trabinsky, who was a Canadian business entrepreneur. This guy had his hand in many pots. He got involved with movie theaters, both on Can in Canada and in the United States. Theater, famous plays, uh, films, Broadway, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a lot of money floating around, and he decided to dip into the till and was convicted for it. But he still came back later. He, he's one of those people that doesn't quite go away. And he started new projects even after his sentence was over with. And we're talking about some very significant money that he duped from investors and friends of 500 million Canadians. So a significant amount. Yeah. You have chapter nine, The Blood Countess. And I probably might pronounce mispronounce her name, but you can help us. Kadaya Tassif. Khadija Tassif, I believe it is. She's a new writer to the series. Uh, she's from Pakistan and she's a, a historian and she's fascinated by history and she chose this story. And this is one of those famous ones about Countess Ershavit Bathory, obviously known as the Blood Countess because of, again, you know, when we're dealing with something from the 1600s, you have to wonder how many things are actually came through 
down through the ages, the rumor, but she was a very privileged young woman, very high up in society, lots of wealth. And she seemed to very much enjoy torturing and murdering her female servants. And she even enlisted some of her higher level servants to join her in it. So it became basically... It was so bad. It was so bad that people would actually like hide their daughters if they found out that the countess was looking for more servants. It's interesting that you put it in the historical context that the disregard for servants, let's say some servant were to be killed, there would be no investigation. There would be no need. They weren't considered the same as these nobles whatsoever. So in that context, it really led to years and years, again, despite allegations and rumors that she was protected. And then you also chronicle some of the things like family deaths that seemed to trigger even more brutality. And even more fascinating is the role of other servants in torture and her husband, and before she was widowed, he enjoyed torturing servants as well. So a very interesting context that you provide for this incredible story. It's that whole thing of wealth and privilege and power. I mean, if you can just do anything to anyone and no one's going to call you out on it. Number 10, chapter 10, The Boy Who Thrived by author Kathy Pickens. Yeah, Kathy has also uh, been in the series before. She's an American author. She writes a lot of true crime and crime fiction. And she chose this story because it was close to her, actually. The Boy Who Thrived is about uh, the case of Ray Caruth, who was a famed football player in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he ended up ordering a hit on his pregnant girlfriend, because frankly, he just didn't want to have another kid to have to pay child support for. He had one already yeah. by another woman. So this happened, as I said, in Charlotte, and, and Kathy lives in Charlotte, and she had some tangential involvement in the story as well, because she had been working um, in the legal profession, and as far as doing things like how you would collect evidence in the when the hospital's an emergency, because obviously, if you don't collect this evidence, you may not be able to solve the crime properly. So it's, it's an it's a very fascinating story. And the woman who his girlfriend, who the hit was put on, she's shot. She's taken into the emergency. She doesn't die immediately, and they do manage to deliver her child. But the child's got problems. You're considering how it ended up coming into this world, right? And Kathy's just framed this in a way that you've got this horrible story, this horrible, this dreadful, famous football player just has his girlfriend trying to have her murdered. And yet you have this story of the this happy element of the story about the boy who thrived, who is the son who grows up and is with his grandmother supporting him and trying to do her best for him. And how despite this horrible beginning, how he came out of it and where he is now. And it's an uplifting story if you can find anything uplifting in a in an attempted murder that turns into a murder, but does have that sort of there's still hope in it kind of element. Yeah, it's a rare happy ending in in a horrible story. <laughs> yeah. Now chapter eleven is something that you wrote and it's called The Devil's Prophet. Very interesting. Tell us about this. Yes. Well actually I kind of came upon this by accident and I hadn't realized it at the time, but I had this is about a rock star, Ian Watkins, who was from the band called Lost Prophets. And I had been listening to Lost Prophets at one time until I found out about what Ian had been up to. But there's just so many elements to this story. Again, we've got that sexual predator thing going on here, but it's it's probably Dan, you've you've probably heard everything horrible in true crime there is to read to read and learn about. Close. But I think this is probably gonna rank at the top of the list, wouldn't you say? It's very different and it's unique and I hadn't heard anything about this and it's Again, it's another another horrifying story. There's so many ways that people are victimized. And this is, again, just unique victimization. Yeah. Well, we'll dip into the details after in a bit then. The chapter 12 is called Beretta in Cold Blood. And it is very cleverly titled, by the way. And it's from author Grant Butler. So tell us a little bit about Beretta in Cold Blood. Yes, uh, Grant Butler is new to the series. And it, this is it's rather funny how this story came about. He sent this to me ages ago, not even sure which anthology it was anymore. And 
And I was not able to use it, but there was just something about it. And I said, let me just hang on to this. And so he, I think several books later, I got in touch with him and I said, yeah, I want to use this one. It's about the, the famous television actor, Robert Blake from the United States. And he is charged with murdering his, actually with hiring a hit on his wife in Los Angeles. But there's so many elements in this story and twists and turns and connections in Hollywood and with other famous trials. And I think we'll be talking about this one in a bit more detail, right? Yes, absolutely. Your chapter 13 is Alfredo Cadona, The Daring Young Man on the Flying Trapeze by author Morgan Barber. Yeah, Morgan's uh, returning to the series. She has been in, I believe, two previous books. And this is a this is an interesting one. She chose this story because she's actually involved in trapeze and the rings and all of that and circus acts and whatnot. And Alfredo was a very famous flying trapeze artist and world renowned back in the early 20th century. And she chronicles his life and, and how he got from where he came from. I believe he was from Mexico originally and uh, how he just moved up the ranks and the, that whole kind of lifestyle of people in in this world. And it is, it's a fascinating account of it. But ultimately, when things go wrong for Alfredo, I guess, again, it's a case of someone just unraveling because of his life changing and things he was unable to accept anymore, including the fact that his wife wanted to divorce him. That was something he couldn't quite accept. And he ends up shooting his wife, the attorney's office, which was supposed to be a nice conversation that he wanted with her. And uh, they left them to speak and bang, he kills her and then he kills himself. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop to hear from our sponsor. One of the most serious hiring challenges for businesses this year is the ability to stand out from others and attract the most talented people. And those people are looking for more, like remote working conditions and easier processes for applying for your job. How can you break through the clutter and attract the most qualified candidates for your business? ZipRecruiter. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. How does ZipRecruiter help you stand out to the right candidates? ZipRecruiter's matching technology sends you great candidates for your job so you can then send a personal invite to your top choices. To help get the attention of some quality candidates, ZipRecruiter also offers attention-grabbing labels like urgent, training provided, remote, and more. Get your job noticed by the best and brightest candidates with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash murder. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash M-U-R-D-E-R. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Now, Misty, we were going to explore further the story of the vampire of Holloway Drive by Jill Hand and this mega millionaire son, Blake Libel, and the murder of Ayanna Cassian in May 2016. So tell us a little bit about his background and his aspirations and this Ayanna Cassian. Well, uh, Blake Libel, he came from, as I, as we mentioned earlier, a, a very, very wealthy family in Toronto. I mean, his father was like a mega real estate developer specializing in low-cost, high-volume housing. His his mother was an heiress to a plastics manufacturing fortune. There was just a huge, huge, huge amount of money that he came from. He and his brother, actually, his brother was Cody, his name Cody. So he had a dream, you know, he wanted to get to Hollywood, an inspiring screenwriter, aspiring director, and he eventually got into doing graphic novels and he wanted to, I guess, be this graphic novel king. So he moved to Los Angeles. And again, everything was pretty easy for him because of the fact that he didn't have to worry about how he was going to pay his bills. He right. set up a house in Beverly Hills and then eventually a condo in West Hollywood off the Sunset Strip. So, you know, he was he was desperate to be an A-lister. He just really, really wanted to be up there. And meanwhile, his brother Cody as a sort of an aside, I guess there was probably some sibling, sibling rivalry here because Cody sure. started, he, his brother Cody started this record company and that seemed to take off a little bit better and a little easier, although it didn't really stick around, probably out of boredom. So Blake 
had this whole persona. He was trying to, as one does in Hollywood, and I, you know, I lived in LA, so I saw enough of it myself. People try to put on an image, and he kind of cultivated this image of this kind of geeky, creative type, the one who probably is so involved with his genius that he doesn't have time to like wash his hair or what you know the type hanging out at the Soho club on the strip just really trying to uh, meet people and and be noticed and he was already married that he met this beautiful young woman Iana Cassian who was from Ukraine and she she had dreams too she she was an educated woman she had a good job in Ukraine with I believe it was the tax service but she wanted to be a, a model she wanted to just become a, a you know a A-list model so she moved to Hollywood as well and unfortunately she met Blake and became involved with Blake and they had a, a baby and sadly, what happened was because Blake, he, he was, like I said, he, he had been married already, but he had another woman he had on the go. And he ended up having a charge of, what was it? I believe it was uh, sexual assault. Yeah, sexual assault. And I guess Iana was just, that was the last straw. She, she just, that was, she right. couldn't deal with that. And she moved out of their condo and uh, actually just down the road to the condo her mother was living in because her mother had moved to the States from Ukraine to help take care of the baby. And Blake wanted her to come back. And uh, they, I guess she just figured she'd go and hear what he had to say. And she left the baby with her mother and went down the street to see what Blake was going to say. And she was never seen alive again. There was, uh, you chronicle all the things that the failures that he had, even his his entry into this graphic novel industry, basically he hired everybody to do all of the things involved. So he had an, almost nothing to do with it. And yet it still didn't really attract the kind of attention that he wanted. As you as you write, his brother received more attention from the media. And that's what Blake was craving anyway. And as you write, he's he was known for his weirdness and his horrible hygiene. So he was just considered weird and considered unhygienic, to say the least, and not talented. And so other things happened as well that probably didn't help his demeanor and his psychological behavior was was uh, exacerbated by fights with his own family when his mother died. And virtually everybody in the family was fighting over the wills themselves. And at the same time, he had these failures. And then Ayanna was uh, pregnant, and then he had sexual charges with somebody that else was, was in the industry as well, and he was released on $100,000 bail. Yeah. What happens in terms of this derailment from sanity that he seems to encounter? You know, that's the thing. I mean, there there is really no solid explanation for what it was that he did. The author does attempt to try to find a reason for it, but he kills he kills Ayanna, but you know, he doesn't just kill her. He literally tortures and mutilates her for hours and hours and hours inside the condo. I mean, the place was a bloodbath. Even when the police finally went in there, they just had never seen anything like it. I mean, she was scalped. She was basically drained of blood and went on just she was alive through it. So, I mean, you can't even imagine how how horrendous that must have been. She probably welcomed death by, you know, by the time it happened. So this isn't just somebody who flips out and just takes it out on his on his fiance. This is somebody who just went on a rampage of violence. And, and I don't know if it was directed at her or if it was just directed at life in general for dealing him maybe what he considered a raw hand because he just couldn't quite get there. We had a little bit of this, you know, little success doing a couple of directing a few series of some sci-fi, I think Spaceballs, this and that. I mean, he had a graphic novel published, which um, is an interesting aside here. But the graphic novel was called Syndrome. And it was a gory and a violent graphic novel and it was actually used in the court case and and called a blueprint for Iana's murder. Yes, you you chronicle all the torture and even including bite marks. They said it was like a like an animal, the akin to an animal biting this person. And she put up a heroic fight. She you say that she was five foot four and maybe 150 pounds and he was six foot three, maybe 210 pounds, but he had some injuries and she fought hard and he tortured her 
for hours and hours. Yeah, I believe they found out it was the coroner that it took eight hours for her to finally die. I mean, not eight hours. That's just beyond thought. And you chronicle too as well, based on her mother's uh, concerns, the police finally did go there. It was a couple of days later and broke the door down and discovered this incredible, horrific scene. And he was barricaded in that bedroom, the mattress up against the door. They finally, he asked for his father to come, but it really was his accountant. His mentor came, negotiated him to come out of that room. And you described the demeanor that he came out of that room. Tell us just about what happens when he comes out of that room in terms of just what he says to the people and, and how he acts? Well, you know, I, I think it was he came out just in his underwear and that he just seemed to act as if she wasn't dead. And then he later says, oh, yeah, there she is. She's dead in that bed. Just sort of resigned to it, you know, just kind of gone. It makes you wonder what kind of mental state he was in. I mean, I don't I think as far as if there was any drug use, I know it was mentioned he he smoked weed, but I don't think that would cause anything this like to this level. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the the writer actually surmised that maybe he suffered from something, you know, maybe it was bipolar, even though that normally doesn't cause this kind of violence or whatnot. But yeah, he was just not really that bothered by it. It's incredible the level of depravity that he inflicted upon this person. And it seems to be, I mean, never can it be condoned or or explainable, I should say. But in this particular case, the level of savagery to her face, the scalping, taking off eyebrows and skin and all the bags of flesh that they found, the mutilation that was done seems to have no reason whatsoever. In fact, there is no inkling of motive that he would do this level of mutilation in in terms of part of the murder. He lured her to this location saying, let's get back together. She left her child behind with her, I believe her mother. And, and so he lured her to her death and went to some great lengths to be able to torture and mutilate her for some completely unknown reason. Yeah, I mean, if if he was just lashing out at the world for, for his failures, I mean, she really wasn't anybody that was behind the failures. But yeah, actually, I just remembered too, he was known to take mushrooms. But again, that's not something that causes people to become violent. So it's just this, we'll probably really never know why he chose her, maybe just because she was there you know? Absolutely. It's unexplainable. Let's talk about the story that you wrote, The Devil's Prophet and the the band that centers in this, The Lost Prophets. Yeah, well, that is a, <laughs> again, you know, a lot of people may not be familiar with this band, The Lost Prophets. They, just to give a bit of an overview, they really rose to success from around 2000 onward. And the band consisted, these were lads, nice Welsh lads from, from Wales and the outside Cardiff. The band had a lot of success. I mean, we're talking silver, gold, and platinum albums, awards from New Musical Express and Kerrang! They were voted best British band two years in a row. So, you know, we're talking a band of substance. This is this is definitely a successful rock band. Now, they were kind of, they were known as what's called a straight edge band, which are people, generally bands not into drugs and alcohol. And so that right. was just sort of the rule of thumb for them. But Ian Watkins, their their lead singer, he diverged from that because he began using an estimated maybe around 2007. He, he just became, started more and more heavily using crack cocaine and meth. And then he became around the same time as well with a, an interest in extreme pornography, stuff on the internet. He even did stuff of himself, you know, uploaded images of himself in extreme sex acts and uploaded them to websites. Again, I don't know if we could say he was unraveling or if he was just starting to show his true colors, but right. he would he cultivated a lot of female fans, particularly female fans who had young children. And he spoke openly to these fans. I mean, he had his sort of like a trusted fan base. Uh, I'm not sure if other bands have that, but he had his trusted female fans and would speak about his interest in having sex with children. And a lot of these female fans had young children. As the band put out more albums, they became more successful. And, you know, they did tour 
outside of Britain. They did, you know, they were in the States and other places like that. So they had a following, international following. And like the aforementioned Jimmy Savile, there was that charity figure thing as well connected to Ian Watkins. He was involved in Kidney Foundation Wales, I think it's called. And one of the reasons he was involved in that was because his mother had a kidney disease and had had a kidney transplant. So he had this persona, he was like a good charitable guy. He dated celebrities, attractive young women, Fern Cotton, TV celeb in the UK, he dated her and Alexa Chung. So he had this persona, you know, that you would never think that he was up to something very sinister and very sick behind the scenes. Let's stop for this commercial break. Now, we talked about the lost profits and their continued success, it seemed. They write about gold, silver, platinum record sales, U.S. record deals. So they were becoming more and more successful. And yet he was, by 2012, you say that he was sexually abusing a female fan's baby boy even filmed himself. And this is right after appearing on BBC Radio One. So despite the success, this deviance was was at this incredible level and he was abusing a female fans, baby boy. Tell us what happens, you say, inadvertently and unconnected drug bust leads to the arrest. Tell us what happens. Well, actually, within like uh, 2011, 2012, there were two two main women who do reappear later because they're also charged. But he was abusing one female fan's baby boy and the other was infant girl. But so too were the mothers participating in the abuse, yes. which is pretty horrendous. I mean, it's all horrendous, but I mean, they're, the mothers as well, that's just bizarre. So there was like one of the abuse was taking place on Skype. So, you know, there was evidence. So what happened was there was an unconnected drug bust, as we mentioned, at his home that was believed he smuggled in drugs from the United States. So when they went to bust through the drug bust, it uncovered this pretty, pretty substantial amount of evidence of the sexual abuse. I mean, they found evidence on his computer, laptops, mobile phones. He was savvy enough. He had enough tech savvy that he actually had encrypted files stored on cloud servers. They actually uncovered 27 terabytes of data storage. That's a tremendous amount yes. of storage of all, all of this stuff, images, videos. I mean, there were even videos of him in the United States with some very young teenage girls who would be lured to his hotel room, or maybe they just went anyways. But I mean, there was one I think he filmed, gave her heroin and was taking her virginity. I mean, really, I mean, the guy, yeah. that was going back years. So, I mean, I believe that the farthest back they were able to trace was 2007. But, you know, sexual predators don't suddenly just wake up one day and decide to molest children. And this is something that usually is dates back to when they first developed their own sexual sexuality. So God knows what was not never uncovered. But the only thing is because when he became a big, huge rock star, the evidence was found and he was saving the evidence of his crimes. But this turned into an inter- international investigation, obviously. I mean, Interpol, right. Britain, the U.S., at Homeland Security. He denied the charges, you know, despite the huge amount of evidence. And I mean, this, how do you deny this the stuff that even he's in himself? But he denied it. He denied it up until the very last minute when he was in court, probably figured he claims he didn't quite realize the charges that were against him and how serious it was. Yeah. And his female accomplices were also charged and sentenced as he was. But unlike him, The female accomplices were considered victims. And in Britain, as a victim, your identity will be kept secret by law. Mm. You know, it's up to you if you want to accept the fact that were they victims or were they willing participants or were they just a combination of both? Well, yet at the same time, if they were considered victims, they did get pretty serious sentences, especially for the UK. One of the people that was considered was named B, was 14 years, and they could be paroled in half of that time. And the other one was 17 years sentence. And and he was sentenced to 35. His was 29, and you say custodial, increased to 35 years, but six of those years are 
are considered licensed, which is released under supervision. Maybe you can explain what that means. Yeah, it would be he would serve that custodial sentence in prison. And then I guess that if he doesn't get into any more trouble, although he does get into trouble later, he would be out and then supervised. But yeah, I don't know if any any person in their right mind thinks this guy should be out roaming the streets, supervised or not supervised. You yeah, know, be, be, well. not with this track record, not with this list. Yeah. Well, you, you write that 27 terabytes, but what that really amounts to is 250,000 photos, 250 movies, and 500 other hours of video. And that's before they expanded the investigation to other countries. And this is, uh, he's 36 years old when he gets sentenced. So also there's an investigation into what went wrong all along the way. And about also about not acting on allegations made by various people. Wasn't, that was true in this case. Yeah, I, I think that's one takeaway from this book is is seeing how celebrity status basically was a, was a protective barrier. You know, people do not believe allegations made, like with Savile, in, and there's parallels with the Savile case with, with this, with Ian Watkins. But in, in the Watkins case, there were people who went to police, you know, fans, female fans who said, look, this guy is, he's saying he wants to have sex with babies. He, he's doing this, he's doing that. And interestingly enough, his former girlfriend, Joanne Majelix, who had actually worked as an escort as well, she had said that he had told her many times that this was what his goal was, you know, to actually have sex with a baby. And he even wanted to get her pregnant so that they could have one at home. I mean, this is, this, I don't know how much sick, you, how more sick you could get from this. And she did go to the police. She went to the police time and time and time again. And the usual answer, you know, they just were kind of fluffed off as, oh, they're just fans. They're just stalkers. They're just troublemakers. They're just girlfriends, ex-girlfriends with a grudge. So Joanne decided she's going to try to do something to get some solid evidence. And she tried to kind of entrap him doing like a conversation online, chats, swapping photos and whatnot. And of all things, she's the one who's charged with potentially being involved in child pornography and whatnot. Wow. What irony is that? Uh, I mean, she fortunately did the charges dismissed, but <laughs> it's like everybody's in trouble except for the person who's actually doing it. What of this Lost Prophets uh, music? Well, obviously, <laughs> you know, the, the the band suffered for this. I mean, their their records disappeared from the shelves. I mean, the guys really, really did everything they could to distance themselves from, from Ian Watkins starting another band. And and there's a really it's sad too, because I mean, you know, these these guys were just trying to make their music and whatnot. And because of what Watkins did, they ended up being targeted. People refused to believe that they didn't know what their lead singer was up to. Right. But they didn't even see him that much. I mean, they like nine months out of the year, they didn't see this guy. They didn't even, I believe Watkins was still living in Wales and the rest of the guys were living in, in LA. So they had no idea what he was up to, but they were getting pretty bloody fed up with him because he was just becoming impossible to deal with. I mean, he was giving substandard performances. Sometimes he didn't show up. There was even an incident where I believe it was the guitarist just blew up and hit him in the head with a can of energy drink. He was just so disgusted with him. But they had no idea what he was doing. I mean, they knew he was sort of going downhill and a lot of it was the drugs. And he had, and they did give him an ultimatum to clean up his act, and he did for a while. But yeah, it was it was just horrendous. So yeah, you know, a lot of people were affected by this case, and professionally and personally. I mean, the, the guys in the bands were getting death threats. Their families were getting death threats just because of the connection. Yeah, it's incredible too. You also include just briefly the sort of prior conduct of the sordid history of rock and roll stars and underage female fans, and sort of how. People look the other way or and the knowledge that some of these stars dated 14 year olds and 15 year olds and had relationships with them seems to be not discussed anymore. till we get to a case, a more modern case where this is absolutely not permissible and and he's taken it to levels that no one else would have ever imagined. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do give a bit of an introduction because I, there's just this whole culture of like sort of an accepted thing about uh, famous guys having sex with underage girls. And in the industry, it was not really talked about in the past. The 70s were probably 
one of the one of the worst examples of how these things weren't really nobody was bothered. It was just a done thing. But we all know that. Look, females and rock male rock stars. Look, there's always going to be that that attraction, and and fans will some fans will go to a lot of lengths to get close to their their idols and do anything that idol would want them to do. But the fact that Ian Watkins had all these female fans who were basically he found some who were willing to give up their own infants to him for his twisted desires. This is far, this is pretty far out for any fan to be willing to go. You have to admit. Yes, absolutely. And final story that we're going to discuss a little bit is the Beretta and Cold Blood and this Bonnie Lee Bakley. I'm talking about somebody that wanted to be famous. And if she couldn't be famous personally, then she would surround herself with famous people. You say that the trial of Blake was influenced by several prominent trials and crimes, and it was directly connected and the trial to and its aftermath had an unexpected impact on American society. Yeah, uh, this is an interesting story because it's not just about Robert Blake. I mean, it's almost the actual the actual glue that holds everything together is this Bonnie Backley, who Blake did end up marrying. But she had a bit of a history. You know, she had a desire to be famous or at least be famous. And the method of becoming connected to somebody who was famous. And so how she, she kind of made a career out of trying to get close to famous men. I mean, she had a, she she tried with Jerry Lee Lewis, even claiming that I believe that she had his baby. Even Dean Martin, when he was like extremely elderly, she was trying to get close to him. Chris, Christian Brando, who Marlon Brando's son, who uh, ended up being imprisoned for for killing his half sister's boyfriend. So she had a lot of connection. It's as if she was this this almost like this bad luck for a lot of people. But so Robert Blake, you know, as everybody pretty much knows Robert Blake, I mean, he got his start as in the Little Rascals back in the 30s and 40s. But his big break came when he played in the film adaptation of the Truman Capote true crime novel in Cold Blood. Yes. And then in the 70s, the Beretta TV series where he's a mm-hmm. uh, the cop who solves all the crime, you know, the Mr. Yeah. Good Guy. So he actually married her. After she had a baby, uh, she first claimed it was Christian Brando's baby, but it was found that it was actually Robert Blake's baby. And so he married her. But it sounds like they had a bit of an odd relationship because I believe that she didn't even live in the same house with them. She lived in a guest house on the property. So what happened was it was back in 2001 and they were having dinner in Studio City. And he he kept he had a gun with him, I guess, for protection or whatever. But he supposedly forgot his gun back in the restaurant. He went went in there to get it. And when he came out, he found his wife shot to death in the car because she was waiting for him in the car. He He's ultimately arrested for her murder. And it was believed at the time the case was that he'd hired some guys in the business to kill his wife. But more so than just the actual killing is how uh, the writer ties all these things in together with, for instance, the infamous O.J. Simpson murder trial for murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and Ron Goldman, her friend. We're talking two similar cases here where a very famous person is put on trial for murder, a murder of a family member, either wife or ex-wife, and they get acquitted, not guilty. But later on, there is a civil trial and they are found, both cases found liable in the civil trial. And what's interesting in the story is how writer Grant Butler ties it all together about how the lessons from the OJ trial carry forward into the lessons from the Blake trial. And that here we're talking about people who you're not necessarily putting the person on trial. You're putting that person's reputation, that person's image. And how do you actually divorce that? from the real person in front of you who committed a crime. You know, is O.J. Simpson the hero, the football hero, the movie star? Did he kill someone? Did Robert Blake, this is Beretta, the nice policeman, Mm -hmm. cop who solves all the crimes. Did he commit a murder? So it's an interesting thing in how these cases bounce off one another and how the outcomes of the cases affected a lot of other things, like people's political careers, for instance, in the state of California. So it is fascinating. I want to thank you so much for coming on, Mitzi Serrato, for coming on and talking about the best new true crime stories, crimes of famous and infamous criminals. I know this is just the the seventh in your series, The Best New True Crime Stories. For people that might want to take a look at this and other 
your other books in this series. Do you have a website or do any social media? Tell us about that. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm always on social media. I have my website, BitsySoretto.com, and I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on even the infamous TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And I have a YouTube channel. So, yeah, you can find me quite easily. And as I said, this is the seventh book in the series, and each one is a different theme. So you get all new stories from a really interesting worldwide stories. Yes, absolutely. The best new true crime stories, crimes of famous and infamous criminals. Mitzi Cerrito, thank you so much for this interview and you have a great evening. Good night.